Board. Good morning, Brian. Good morning there, Skip. How you doing? Good morning. I'm just waiting to see whether we're on or not. Okay. As people are coming in to settle in, I welcome you. This day, uh, uh, we're going to be few in number because of all the ice that we have. And we actually did cancel in-person service that was going to broadcast, but I'm glad that a lot of you didn't get the message and you came anyways. So uh, we're glad that you are with us. And as we come together, I'll let you know that we will not have the trustees meeting this afternoon because Tammy said, I think we're going to cancel that. So we will not have the trustees meeting this, this afternoon after church. We want to remind you that on Wednesdays, we have a drop-in hot lunch at 11.15, and you're welcome to come and have a free hot lunch. And if you want to come before, we play some games and have some good fellowship and practice safety in doing so. We also then follow in uh, at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. We do have uh, our continuing study that we have from 1 to about 2.15, and we're studying the Gospel of Luke. And so in the Gospel of Luke, we are at chapter 7, I believe. And so if you'd like to join with us online or in person, we'd love to have you. And you can also text your observations and your questions to us at my phone number that is listed for you there. And you find us on uh, Facebook at God's Word for the Day. And God is spelled capital G-O-D, capital G, capital O, capital D. And then... Uh, word for today, and you can then connect with us. January 16th is Friendship Sunday, and that's when we usually have a brunch after service, and so you're in, uh, encouraged to invite a friend to come to worship with us, and uh, we're going to be celebrating the spiritual legacy of Martin Luther Jean King Jr. during that service, and I'll begin t a teaching series, a new teaching ser series, by request of a couple of members of our congregation, on discerning God's will for our personal lives. So we'll be looking at how do we discern God's will for our lives. And then following worship, we always retreat down to our fellowship hall, and there we have a nice brunch. So if you want to bring something to share, you're welcome to do so. And also on that Sunday, we invite you, if you want to give a special donation for our supplies that we use to purchase um, uh, materials for packing our lunches for the homeless. We pack about 100 lunches right now, uh, and so we do that on that Wednesday, the 19th, and so we always need to buy some supplies to be able to pack those lunches, and then we distribute them in downtown Syracuse. Again, if you'd like to serve as a liturgist or a reader, or you'd like to provide bull a bulletins or flowers uh, for our sanctuary, there's a sign-up sheet that's out. Uh, in our lounge, please uh, take the opportunity to uh, sign up if you'd like. I would also would like to encourage you, I have a copy of our um, directory and also celebration list of birthdays and anniversaries. Please take time to go through that and correct any misinformation that might be there. So then when I uh, publish our new directory, we can have the most updated information uh, that we can. With that, I just want to uh, welcome you again, those who join us online, uh, and also those of you who are present. I thank you for your presence with us this day. Without further ado, let's go ahead and begin our worship. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning Eileen. <laughs> when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the, when kings, the kings and the princes, princes are home, when, when the, the shepherds, shepherds are back in their flock, flock. The, the real work, work of Christmas, Christmas does not end, but, but begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feel, feed the hungry. To release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among neighbors, and make music in the hearts of humanity. Let us remember the call of Jesus upon our lives and proclaim in word and deed the spirit of Christmas. I gave uh, Sylvia this morning off because of traveling from where she had to come from. And so we uh, will be singing a cappella. 
So you have to follow me. If you'd rise to your feet and we'll sing our first song. It's in your little black hymnal called Shine, Jesus, Shine. And it's found on page 1273. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let their Shining in the midst of the darkness, shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us, set us free by the truth. You now bring us, shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence. From the shadows into your radiance, by the blood I may enter brightness. Search me, try me, consume my darkness. Shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine <laughs> this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so may our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Praise God. Please be seated and let us join our hearts in prayer as Eileen lead us, leads us in prayer. Lord, we have left the manger. We have experienced the glory of your birth in our hearts. You live with us and, um, and among us as we've just proclaimed and sung. May your glory shine in us and through us. There is a joy and a peace we enjoy at Christmas but which, when the celebration is past, is so quickly forgotten, packed away like our ornaments. Help us to claim the gifts you have offered us. Help us to use them to invest in the life of this world and culture. Cause them to grow as we grow in our faith and faithfulness to impact the world in which we live. May others see and witness Christ in us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd ask Sharon if she would share with us a witness from a hymn that we will not sing, but also the witness from the life of its author, uh, Philip Doddridge. Uh, 
And so uh, Eileen is graciously going to share that with us this morning. Great God, we sing that mighty hand by which supported still we stand. The opening year, thy mercy shows, that mercy crowns it till its close. By day, by night, at home, abroad, still are we guard, guarded by our God, by his incessant bounty fed, by his unerring counsel led. With grateful hearts, the past we own, the future all to us unknown. We to thy guardian care commit, and peaceful leave before thy feet, in scenes exalted or depressed. Thou art our joy, and thou art our rest. Thy goodness in all our hopes shall rise, adored through all our changing days. In scripture, the hand of God often refers to judgment, but for the Christian, it is also an image of providential care. We can see this throughout the book of Ezra, where the priest attributed his success to the fact that the gracious hand of God was upon him. Philip Doddridge felt the same way. The youngest of 20 children, that's right, I said 20 children, he was considered too sickly to live, but the gracious hand of God was upon him. His parents died when he was only a teenager, but he was taken in by a minister who nurtured him physically and particularly with regards to his faith. Doddridge became a pastor and educator, a hymn writer and an author. One theme remained uppermost in his mind, the providence of God. He wrote his hymns to illustrate his sermons and taught them to his congregation. The words of this hymn, Great God, We Sing, That Mighty Hand, apparently illustrated a New Year's sermon where once again the theme of God's providential care emerged. God is still our guide and guardian as we pursue this new year and its challenges. Let us remember the words from Psalm 9, 8 through 10. He, Lord, is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know thy name put their trust in thee, for thou, O Lord, have never forsaken those who seek thee. At this time, I was going to have a children's uh, time, but um, we will forego that today. I want to turn to our sharing of our joys and also concerns, thanking Eileen for being willing to fill in at the last moment as our liturgist for today. We want to celebrate the birthdays of Hannah Penoyer, uh, is who has a birthday on the 10th. And I believe that uh, since her mom is here, if you cannot find in the directory uh, that's out there uh, her address, you can ask her mom or dad, and I bet they can get it to her. And she'd enjoy receiving, even if it's a belated birthday card, please uh, make sure that you celebrate her. Uh, also, Richard Bloomer, um, Shirley Aylesworth, uh, is a member of this congregation. She joins us online from where she lives in Whitesboro, I believe it is. And so uh, we say hi to you and happy birthday to you, uh, to her husband, Richard, and Eloise Dunn, who was a fixture here in this church. We know that dementia and strokes have taken her away from us. She's in a nursing home and kind of living in her own world right now. Uh, but we want to pray for her well-being and we look forward to her healing, as in time, God will take her back to be with himself and restore her to fullness of health, fullness of mental capacity, and we wish and enjoy enjoying that for her. So please be praying for Eloise Dunn. We also want to, as I had uh, conversations with Jean Ch Case yesterday, <coughs> excuse me, she uh, asked prayer, and I prayed with her, uh, for her granddaughter and grand, great grandchildren uh, as they are all suffering from COVID. So we want to lift them up in our prayers. We want to, and I celebrate this, this is really a joy, uh, we pray for our education team. Our education team consists of Julie Kelsch. Uh, she's not here today, Ron is. It's nice to see that you dared the ice. Um, 
and Karen Gloyd, whom she's been here a couple times. She's my former, former associate pastor of education at Liverpool, and she left that position, and she's volunteering to come and help us direct and form an education program for children. And then Elizabeth Patino, uh, they're not here as well, but Elizabeth has some children, and uh, they're going to form a team for creating our educational program. I know some of their, their plans already, is, uh, but they need to talk, and they will do so next week, and, and we'll let you know uh, what will be happening. And I'm excited about that because for several years now, because of COVID, and we have not been able to provide an educational program for children. And now we're going to be able to do so. And I just think that's tremendous. So if you know some, some children, whether grandchildren or whatever, whatever their age, I'm going to be asking that you provide their contact information, their age and grade, um, so that we can contact them and invite them uh, to come and join with us on the Sunday that we begin our education program. But that's good news. We also pray for the communities recovering from natural disasters. And instead of just looking at the ones from that tornado, there's several throughout our country that are suffering at this time, whether it be through snow or tornadoes or whatever it is. We want to also lift up Pam Mackey. Bill Fugel and I communicated with, with Kim yesterday. He is doing better, uh, but he's still in grave concern and uh, for the functioning of his kidneys and several other things. And so uh, she says our prayers have helped and she really requests that we continue in prayer for Bill. We also want to pray for Daryl Hoffman. We celebrate his healing, but he also then had a relapse and had to have surgery. He's doing very well. Bill Mann, Pam Moore, uh, Ken Jackson, I know that he's home, but as I sh shared with, with Jean yesterday, um, she was concerned that she may have to make that decision to put him into a nursing facility. And I know that's hard for her. So please uh, be praying for her. There are several others that are there before us that we must and should lift up in our prayers. And I also would pray that if you have a concern for yourself or someone else, there are prayer cards in the pews. There are also prayer cards that are also in our, um, uh, on our table as you enter into the sanctuary. Please feel free to, uh, to complete one of those so that we can uh, pray for you and pray for those you are concerned with. Are there any joys or concerns that you would like to share openly as we meet together today? Then let us pray in silence, lifting up before God those things that are in our heart, in our mind, that can be distractions in our faith, but yet when we turn to you, we understand hand of God is upon us, and we are in the hands of God. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful for the many ways that you touch our lives. In this new year, as we perceive of the problems that surround us, and our culture, and our country, and our world, we can be drawn to despair. Let us not be looking at the problems, but the opportunities those problems present us. For with every curse, with every struggle, there are also opportunities. Had it not been, O oh Lord, for COVID, we might not have broadcast and extended our reach beyond this community. You give us the opportunities through all the problems to be able to reach out, to strengthen our witness, to be a caring presence for others. As Christians above any other persons in our, in our communities, Lord, we are those who have faith, and that faith should be a light that guides us, that we might then capitalize on all the opportunities you lay before us. As we begin this new year, help us to live by that light and follow that light, the light that brings joy and peace and hope. 
Oh, gracious God, we just pray you lift us from our burdens and those who have burdens, and particularly those who have burdens where we have contact with them, may we bring your light and life. Let us help them to see that they're not isolated, they're not alone, that there is a God and there is a people who follow Jesus Christ, who will love them and care for them. This we humbly ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ, the one born in Bethlehem, the one who is the word, the one who is the light of the world, as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to ask that if uh, two people would come to be ushers and come re retrieve the plates, and uh, shouldn't take very long to take the offering this morning. we bring the offering forward today, we'll be singing a new offertory uh, piece, which is found in him in your black hymnal, number 2071, Jesus, name above all names. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord. Christ, we hear your word, we have seen your word, we have been touched by your word. Your word now has been born, not just in a manger 2,000 years ago, but born in our heart. Live and grow within us to maturity, and we give you thanks for all your gifts to us, for this community, for our faith that we share together, for the purpose you give to us and the calling you call us to, that we so oftentimes do not feel adequate to meet. Lord, 
where we are not able, you are able. And we give you thanks and praise for the gifts you give to us that enable us to fulfill your calling in our lives. Amen. Amen. I'd ask if you might turn. Uh, we can keep social distancing easy today. But we can take one right on the peace and love of Jesus Christ. Good morning. How are you feeling here, Sister Sue? You can wave to the camera for those that normally might have been here but are not today. I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the beauty of my King. So I love you with the love of the Lord. So I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the beauty of my King. So I love you with the love of the Lord. I'm going to change our order just a little bit. You can keep it on that slide. I'm going to invite you to be seated. <coughs> Since the next hymn I was going to have us sing is a little bit more difficult without our pianist to be with us, we'll forego that for another time. Instead, I'll share with you the word for today. And it comes to us from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3. And so this is how this reading for this day goes. Indeed, if others have reason for their confidence by their own efforts, I would even have more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church and as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness, through obeying the law, rather I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends upon faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection of the dead. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ has first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us all. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I share with you then these questions of life and faith. What do you want changed in your life? Who do you hope to be a year from now? 
How will you make it happen? You know, typically as we approach the beginning of a new year, people always have resolutions. I want to lose weight, some people might say. I want to be healthier. I want all sorts of different things as we look at those resolutions, what we want to happen in our lives. They're very practical, they're down to earth, they're from what we experience in our lives. But seldom do we ever really attain those changes. And the question becomes, what changes do we really want to happen, and should we want to happen? I think sometimes we make our desires for change, our goals for our life, too shallow. They are not deep enough or dramatic enough. And some might say, well, wait a second, I have a hard time, you know, bought this exercise equipment, and by March it will be out front, and people can take it away, or they'll put it on Marketplace and they can pay me for it so I can recoup some of my money. We have a difficulty at trying to live up to those commitments that we make. That was the intention behind this, these questions that I gave to you. What do you want changed in your life? Now some people who are older will say, well, not much can be changed. I like to be healthy, healthier, but you know, I'm on this pattern of the golden years that I'm going down, and the golden years are not necessarily so golden. There are struggles and challenges that we have to face. And so we look ahead and anticipate, well, if I can just keep what I have, I'll be doing good, right? So a lot of people have different goals for their life, and many people don't really have goals at all. This is my life. I've lived my life. This is my job. This, I had a hope for family, I have my family, I have a hope for this, for that, and this then has defined my life. Even religiously or spiritually, we have certain goals. I want to be part of the church, I want to become part of the family of God, but that becomes the fullness of it. <coughs> and it kind of tends to stop there. We can easily limit ourselves and come to the place well, I have attained my goals. I don't have any other goals at all for me to strive after. Particularly in the spiritual realm, people can tend to be that way. Here we find the words of St. Paul. And I focused upon them because all of a sudden it has to do with goals. And he also mentions how he has been possessed. I press on to possess that, perfer per that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Many people in reading the writings of the Apostle Paul would say, yeah, he was possessed. I don't mean possessed by the devil, but possessed. There are some people who seem to be driven. We might say ups, uh, up, up, obsessed. They're obsessed with a certain goal, and they strive at it. You know, for anyone that wants to attain something that they long for, it becomes an obsession. You look at an athlete and they're obsessed with being able to perform and perform well. And so they have to discipline themselves. I have another passage there which uh, he wrote uh, to us. And what she describes then, um, the pressure of being driven. <coughs> From 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, he writes, Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. 
Now we can understand with an athlete as we're coming upon the, the Super Bowl in the next couple weeks, and the playoffs that are happening in the next couple weeks, we understand how there are those who are obsessed or have as their goal that they're going to win a specific prize. And so they train themselves and they strive after doing what they can to be able to attain the prize, which will be a Super Bowl ring. But seldom do we apply that for ourselves. What about in our lives? You know, we won't get, obtain a Super Bowl ring. But in many ways, the scriptures talk about receiving a crown, a crown of rejoicing. At the end of our days, do we then feel like we have run the race, another image that Paul has used, to run the race well? Will we, at the end of our race, be able to hear within our mind the Lord saying, well done? For those who are followers of Jesus Christ, that is our goal. We want to hear that word, well done. But the question comes to us, at least to me, is how much am I investing to win the prize? So I, I titled this message, and I put it on the front of the bulletin, In the Game. I have to ask you, are you in the game? Are you just sitting along the sidelines, waiting for those opportunities that you might have to be able to get in the game? But are you just getting by? Are you just following the normal course and goals that you have established as defining of your life? This is my life. My job. I dreamed about having a family, home, whatever it might be. Is this all there is to life? And for many people, they'll be satisfied with that. They'll be satisfied spiritually in saying, okay, now what happens is that I go to church, I do the things minimally that I need to do. Do you hear the word minimally in there? This defines my life. There is no sense of obsession or possession. Are we to be as obsessed and possessed? I think so. Are we to be as driven? Listen to what Paul writes. He says, as he mentions all the things in his life that he should count as assets. What assets do you have in your life? What have you done? What have you accomplished? You've gone to college? Had a good job? Have you accomplished these things that you thought were part of the goal and how your life would be? Are you satisfied with that? And all of a sudden he says, you know, I once thought these things were valuable to me. But now I consider them worthless. Do you that? Worthless. What do you count as the assets to your life? Paul said, I count them as worthless. The actual word there is I, he says garbage. He says, I, I consider them dung. Horse manure. I'd say another word, but you know, I don't want to be criticized for saying it. But that's the actual word that Paul uses. You know what I'm talking about. He considered all those things as totally worthless. And he says, I have now, and the word worthless, he uses several times, is the word loss. I consider them a loss to my life of not having a benefit to me. The word for loss is. Dasriya, Dasriya. It's difficult. And what it means is a detriment. And he violently repudiates their impact on his life. Now I disagree with him in that many of the gifts that God has given to us, once we give our lives to God and surrender, all of a sudden we can use those assets and they're directed at building our lives the way God may want them to be. They aren't useless, but he considers them useless because if he focused upon them, he built his life upon those assets to the neglect of a spiritual relationship. He now has said that what is most important to me is my life in Christ, lived through Christ. That's what he says. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. 
Think about that. What is the greatest asset that you have for your life? I pray that it is your relationship. I know that it's because of my relationship with Jesus that I can, ha I can look at the assets that I have in my life and I realize it was by the hand of providence that God provided those assets. Even in my relationships, as I celebrated my 40th with my lovely bride, you know, that's an asset. Did I deserve that? Did I work for that? It was a gift given to me by God. I needed to respond to that. Everything is changed in our focus when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden we realize that everything we might consider as a value and asset to us only has its value when it is placed in the hands of God. And then it is magnified, intensified, and directed with purpose. So I want to just address a few things that I think is important for us. The second question, who do you hope to be a year from now? Not what will you attain, what will you get in the next year, but who will you be? Have you ever thought about that? What is the focus of your prayers to God? Lord, I want to be more loving. And then we take the particularity of that hope and say, these are the people in my life and they challenge my ability to love. So help me, O oh God, to be more loving. Help me to be closer to you that I might experience your presence in my life. And you know, if you have your goals, then you can have your plan. If you don't have any goals, you do not have a plan. So I guess the first thing I would advise myself, as I would you, is what is your goal in life? You see, a lot of the goals, people might think, they're past me. I can't do that now, what I dreamed of. But wherever we are at this given moment in time, we can have the goal of being closer to God through Jesus Christ. Of being a witness and servant with what God has given us where we are at this present moment in time. I can certainly have people in my life that I can love more deeply. There are relationships that I can forgive. There is reconciliation that I can strive after. There are so many different goals because I want to become like Christ. I want to change who I am. I may not be able to change what has happened in the past, both my failures, nor can I necessarily change my assets, things that I counted on. But I can take the gift of where I am and who I am right now. And over the course of this next year, I can be different. I can draw myself and make myself with God's help to become more of the person that I think that God envisions that I can be. What's important is the vision of what God, we think, could make us be. So first is having a goal. The second is realizing that there's going to be struggle in attaining that goal. And so what he says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize. And he said, I also want to share in his sufferings. What does it mean to share the sufferings of Christ? For me, what it means is that I know who I am and who I, I have a vision of who I should be. My struggles and sufferings in Christ are taking my challenges and then overcoming them with God's help. To not allow them to define me. But I have to anticipate what those challenges are. And then there's going to be challenges that I may not know are, I'm going to confront during this next year. But I need to be prepared for them. So I have a plan. If this is my goal, what's my plan? I need to have a plan. To become the person that God so wants me to become, I need the powers in my hand to determine whether I can make it happen. I know I can't make it happen by myself. I need you. Because you're a gift that God has given to me. I need the Holy Spirit. I need to be closer to Jesus Christ. I need to know more of his word so I can unfold and understand his will. And I need to be able then to understand the resources he has provided me so that I can then accomplish that which I feel that God has called. 
I want to look back after this past year. And I want to see the changes in myself. I want to be able to hear throughout the year that little voice in me saying, well done, Brian. Ah, Brian, you could have done better here. Why don't you let me help you? I want to be molded and shaped by God's vision for my life. I don't have to live someone else's life. I have to live this life, for this is the gift. I didn't have to focus. You see, it's, I can be easily distracted from my goal by everything else that which the world might toss my way. I have to keep my focus. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Do you look forward? Do you know, I've seen football players get tackled because they look behind them as they're being chased. I've been with training of cyclists, and I said, you don't look behind, you look ahead. If we look behind, then we also slow down, and we are distracted, and we miss the mark of what we really want to attain. If someone passes us, they pass us, but we are focused on where we need to go and what we need to be. If we keep our focus, then nothing can distract us from that goal, and we'll more likely attain to that goal. So keeping the focus every single day. Now, how you keep your focus? I know for me, it's spending time in prayer. It's spending time in God's Word. It's spending time with a group of brothers, as I know Ron and Charlie can say, on Monday mornings at 6.30, studying the Word and listening to each other's lives and struggling, struggles and struggling with one another. It takes commitment and investment to be able to build a life that truly is fulfilling and rewarding. That's the choice we have before us. So I'm going to ask you again those three questions. What do you want changed in your life? Oh, I don't know enough about God's Word. How do I know its authority on my life unless I invest myself in the Word, and then I'll come to understand its authority in my life. How do I know the potential that God will be there for me, hope, upholding me, motivating me, encouraging me, coaching me in this life that God has given me, unless I give Him a try, and I do what needs to be done? What do you want changed? How will you make it happen? Who do you hope to be? A year from now? I'll leave that question with you. Who do you hope to be this next year? I want to share with you something before we go into a time of prayer. Uh, I should have shared this easier. I received a letter from our bishop thanking us. Thank you for paying 100% of your shared ministries for 2020. This is a significant achievement, and I'm very mindful that you have accomplished this only through great effort and steadfast commitment. I'll leave this out, out there so you can read it after worship. But you see, a goal requires a commitment and an investment. And a lot of churches can't do that. You, this little church, have been successful, and I praise you for that. I also have another letter here that I will not read to you, but in supporting children and families whose children are deathly ill, St. Jude's Children's Hospital. You have provided over $2,000 this year in order to help support the efforts of those families to live their lives. You have helped Galasano Children's Hospital. You have fed well over 1,400 people meals. This little church. Can you hear? Well done. Can you look ahead as a church and say, what will Jesus say of us this next year? I'm excited to think what I will hear Jesus say as we strive on together in his name. I'm going to invite you to join me in a prayer. It's a typical prayer that John Wesley had his congregations, had his societies pray at a special service called the Covenant Service. We're not doing that full Covenant Service. But this prayer is something that I say 
every single day of my life. I invite you to pray it with me. Lord, my life is no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee, or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. You know, that prayer is dangerous. It is dangerous. I want to be full. I don't want to be empty. I don't want to be laid aside. And there's some people I just do not want to be ranked with, I can tell you. But God want, puts us where God wants us to do what God wants us so that we can build the lives that honor God. May that be your hope and prayer and your goal this year. I invite you to rise where you are seated and join me for our closing hymn. What you'll find the words of, and you have to follow me on, number 21929, I have decided to follow Jesus. May that be your covenant, your promise, your goal this year. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, Still I will follow, no turning back, no turning back. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Have you decided to follow Jesus? Have you decided to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Keep your goal, keep your focus, and keep striving towards the prize that comes to us at the end of the race, whenever God chooses that will be. And may you feel blessed with the companionship of Jesus along the way. Amen. Have a good and godly day.